Good morning, everyone. Uh, we apologize for the delay, but we cannot start any session without the esteemed President Grimson for me. So thank you so much. Um, my name is Daria Shapovalova, and I'm the director of the Energy Law Center uh, at the University of Aberdeen in Scotland, and also the chair of the Scottish Arctic Network. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to our session on building the North Atlantic Green Energy Hub. And countries in the North Atlantic are no doubt uh, leaders in climate action uh, and climate ambition, each choosing their own path to achieving this ambition and focusing on development of a variety of low carbon energy sources based on their natural capital, on their skills pool, on their expertise and infrastructure. And Scotland has very developed offshore and onshore wind sector and ambitious targets for both. It also has domestic targets for community and locally owned energy uh, and government supports to achieve them. Greenland has the abundant hydropower with ambitious plans to expand. Iceland, of course, is very famous for its hydropower. And Denmark is the leader in wind technology and has some very exciting policy tools about how to bring communities on board as well. Faroe Islands are combining a mix of green energy sources to become net zero nation. And just two days ago here in Reykjavik, Nordic energy ministers adopted a declaration emphasizing the importance of energy security, especially in the current times um, and the need to tackle climate change and address uh, concerns through a joint project on sharing experiences and the collaborative approach. And the declaration highlights this role of cooperation, stating that generating more electricity in the Nordic region is a task for individual countries, which have different natural resources and make their own choices. But the Nordic region in general is closely interconnected in many ways. So working closer together um, is very important for transition, for security of supply, the ability to attract investment and to keep the cost down. And there are already some existing physical interconnections in the region. There is a Viking link, which is a 1400 megawatt high voltage direct current electricity link uh, connecting the transmission systems of UK and Denmark. There's Skagerrak, a 1700 uh, megawatt interconnector that links the Norwegian and the Danish transmission systems, which really allows us to tap into the potential of renewables and make the use of them much more efficient. And a few years ago, there were some options. I found the program from the 2016 for this conference, which talked about building the ice link, uh, connecting Scotland and Iceland and Greenland with an electricity cable, and more cables between Iceland and Faroe Islands and Greenland and Iceland. But of course, cooperation is not just about these physical connections. Uh, it's also about sharing research, sharing data, sharing expertise and practices that is very important for developing energy systems that are green, but they're also just and inclusive. And this cooperation on skills and training, on policy and market design, especially now that we're seeing that the current markets are not really delivering the policy objectives that we set for ourselves. Um, the infrastructure to upscale the supply of green energy is very crucial for timely and sustainable transition and energy security. So we can share these experiences to achieve a more just and inclusive energy transition. We know that community opposition to green projects come for many reasons and in many forms. Some concerns can be addressed with a dialogue and uh, appropriate policy tools, but sometimes our processes, policy and legal really do fail of bringing communities on board and making sure we respect human rights as well. So we can learn from each other on how to do things and also how not to do things. Um, so it's a very important conversation that we are having today uh, of bringing um, the experts and ministers in energy from across the North Atlantic region to discuss energy cooperation. So it is my honor to first um, welcome to the stage His Excellency Olafur Ragnar Grimson, former president of Iceland and the chair of the Arctic Circle. I was thinking about it, listening uh, to the remarks that when my parents were growing up, Scotland, Norway and Iceland were among those European territories 
where people decided to leave to North America, Canada, and the United States in greater proportional numbers than in most other European countries. That's why we have so many people of Icelandic, Norwegian, and Scottish descent proportionally uh, in North America. Why did they leave? Why did they leave? Because they didn't believe in the future of these countries. They were all poor. They were, together with Ireland, they were among the poorest territories in Europe, with economies based on oil and coal, mostly imported. For them to look at that part of the world as a model for other continents and other countries in terms of prosperity and clean energy structure would have been uh, a utopia so far away from their reality that it would also have been an impossibility. But that is exactly what happened. It is quite a remarkable fact when we look at the energy economies of Greenland, Iceland, Faroe Islands, Scotland, and Norway. They all have between 60 or 90% plus of their energy production based on renewable clean energy. It's the only part of the world, the only part of the world where you have multiple countries having achieved such an extraordinary high number of renewable energy production. So to that extent, there is already a North Atlantic clean energy hub. It's not a question of building it. It's already here. But the question is, how are we going to use it? Because I am sure for most of you, this is the first time you hear that Greenland, Faroe Islands, Iceland, Scotland, and Norway are the most advanced renewable energy territory in the world, multi-state territory in the world. I, I dare you to find anywhere else in the world five or six countries that link together geographically that have achieved it. You will not be able to find it. And the interesting thing is it's a different energy mix. Hydropower, geothermal power, wind power, and they all achieved this in their different way. That is also what's fascinating about this model. There is not a single approach to this. There's multiple venues that you can utilize to arrive at this final destination. And when the world <clears throat> is now screaming for a renewable energy transition, this offers us not only an extraordinary moral and political position and technological position uh, in the world, but also huge economic opportunities. We started here in Iceland a few years before my parents married the first geothermal heating of a few houses up on the hill and next to where we are here, you walk to the big church on the top of the hill, you are very close to the first houses that in the 1930s got a geothermal heating. We have now in the last 10 years built together with Sinopec in China the biggest geothermal urban heating system, geothermal urban system in the world, in 70 Chinese cities. And as you heard yesterday from Sultan al Jabir, the president of COP28, the climate challenge is all about energy. That is really the simple truth. It's not complicated. The climate challenge is about an energy transition. Unless there is a fundamental global energy transition, we are not going to achieve it. Doesn't matter how many Tesla cars uh, we drive, uh, how many plastic bottles we throw away, unless we have a fundamental, profound, comprehensive energy transformation, we are not going to succeed. The glaciers will continue to melt, the sea level will continue to rise, the extreme weather patterns will keep on happening in Asia, Latin America, uh, Africa, 
on God's word. So, when Anders Paul Rasmussen was Prime Minister of Denmark, long before he became Secretary General of NATO, he came to one of these gatherings of Nordic uh, Prime Ministers, which took place in the, in the Blue Lagoon. And I have to hunt it to Anders Fogh that he had a brilliant idea. He had a very simple message. He said, if you look at the renewable energy achievement of the Nordic countries, wind power, uh, using biomass for energy, hydropower, geothermal power, the Nordic countries are the Silicon Valley of renewable energy. He used that phrase, Silicon Valley. I thought it was brilliant. I thought some people would take it up and, and keep running with that flag. But it didn't happen. He was ahead of his time. He was ahead of his time. Now we have Scotland finally discovering there's a world north of Scotland. So <clears throat> it's fantastic to have Scotland as a part of this North Atlantic gathering because the energy transformation in Scotland is phenomenal, actually phenomenal. So my message here is very simple. I think we should try to create a structure of energy cooperation between all these countries. Greenland, Faroe Island, Iceland, Norway, Scotland. And jointly offer our achievement and knowledge and technology and insights to the rest of the world. To the rest of the world. And I can assure you, there already is a fundamental interest in order to do so, because every country in the world is looking for the solutions. And our northern part, which was so poor when my parents were growing up, the people decided to leave for Canada and the United States. It's now the only advanced, modernized part of the world with integrated clean energy, multinational achievements that can offer the world such an integrated model. And since you mentioned the cables connecting these countries, yes, I have believed in that for a long time, but here in Iceland is a political hot potato, but maybe that will change, we will see. But it makes a lot of sense, that's why the Norwegians are making a lot of money out of uh, selling that uh, electricity to, to, to the rest of Europe. But don't let that prevent the cooperation. Sooner or later, we will come to a crossroad in discussion about uh, uh, the connectors. That's a separate issue. So my message here is very simple. We already have <coughs> a renewable energy hub in, in the North Atlantic, but we need to integrate it. We need to offer it to the rest of the world. And we have to realize that for the rest of the world, we are perhaps just one place. They don't look at us necessarily as multi-countries. Multi we are a small part of the planet when you look at it from Asia, Africa, Latin America, but we don't threaten them. We are respected, we are peaceful, we are modernized, so they don't see any problems in working with us. And if you want to use the Arctic Circle in the coming years as a venue to bring this model forward, and invite international partners to join you, I can assure you the Arctic Circle will welcome you and host you in all the proper ways that you want. Thank you. Thank you so much, President Crimson. So I will now introduce our esteemed panel uh, one by one. Uh, and invite them to this podium to present their vision for the North Atlantic Green Energy Hub before handing over to our excellent moderator, Dr. Hedla Rune Logadotir, who's the Director General of the National Energy Authority in Iceland and the co founder and the former director of the Arctic Initiative at the Harvard Kennedy Center. So, today on the panel, we have Her Excellency Karen Elman, who worked in the Danish Parliament for 15 years in Borgen. Very exciting. And is now the Secretary General of the Nordic Council of Ministers. We have Her Excellency Gillian Martin, who is the Scotland's Minister for Energy and Environment. 
and His Excellency Guslaugur Thor Thordarson, Iceland's Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate. <laughs> My job here is done. Um, we also have a postcard video from Greenland. There's a slight change in our agenda. Um, His Excellency Kalstedlun had to leave, but they sent us a postcard. So first, I would like to invite to the stage Her Excellency Karen Elman. Please, Karen. Thank you very much. I didn't work in the parliament for 15 years. I was elected there. <laughs> but I can assure you, it was hard work. <laughs> so thank you very much for the presentation and, and really for the welcoming remark by President Grimson. Because he's right. We do have our hub already. And I really think that looking at the topic, of course, it's a very important discussion and a very important session. So thank you for being here. The Nordic Council of Ministers is the main forum for official Nordic cooperation, which involves Denmark, Finland, Iceland, Norway, Sweden, the Faroe Islands, Orland, and Greenland. So eight countries consists of the Nordic region, the Nordic cooperation, the official body. So the Nordic countries jointly have a vision, becoming the most sustainable and integrated region in the world. The Arctic area has unique challenges and opportunities in connection with the green transition. Since much of the Nordic territory, both on land and at sea, falls within the Arctic Circle, the Nordic region is, of course, strongly involved in issues that concern this unique and harsh, but also vulnerable area. Can the Nordics, as small countries, lead this green transition? Yes. Yes, we can. The individual Nordic countries, as the president says, said, uh, yes, individually, we are relatively small countries. However, as a region, we cover the Northern Hemisphere from the border of Canada in the West to the Russian border in the East. And the Nordic region is actually the 11th largest economy in the world, making it comparable with Canada. So together, honestly, together, my friends, the Nordic region has some of the largest renewable energy resources in the world, as said earlier. And of course, it's therefore obvious that we look for Nordic solutions for North Atlantic energy cooperation. All Nordic countries in the North Atlantic have set ambitious green transition targets, but are focusing on different energy sources to meet them. As we heard, Greenland has abundant hydropower with ambitions, ambitious plans to expand this. Iceland, yes, famous for your geothermal energy production, and the Faroe Islands are combining a mix of green energy sources to become a zero emission nation. So combined with this extensive Danish wind power experiences and Norwegian offshore know-how, as well as a strong history of energy cooperation between the countries, we are in an excellent position to combine our effort with added value for the individual countries. So in short, we insist on the value of cooperation and on Nordic solutions. Together, we can set standards, develop new ways, and push boundaries. We want to play a vital part in making our region green, competitive, and socially sustainable. A region that is the most sustainable and integrated one in the world. The Nordic Council of Ministers has for years cooperated with our neighbors in the West. An example is the network for net zero energy islands, where Scotland and the Nordic countries exchange experiences on how to decarbonize isolated areas. The latest meeting was held at Shetland this summer, showcasing that we face similar challenges and opportunities, no matter if we live in Scotland, 
the Faroe Islands, Greenland, or Iceland. And this autumn, the electricity transmission cable Viking link between Denmark and the UK will be set in operation. It is a 765 kilometers long cable, approximately the same distance as between Iceland and Scotland, or twice the distance as between the Faroe Islands and Scotland. Connecting UK and the Nordics and facilitating the green transition in both ends of the transmission cable. Building a new, or just making sure that the existing North Atlantic Energy Hub allows us really to be innovative and to, well, so to say, think out of the box. We have to build on national strengths and common opportunities. The Nordic region is jointly in an excellent position to deploy innovative solutions due to ambitious energy and climate policy goals, as well as extensive research programs. All Nordic countries are located by the sea, and together the Nordic region has the largest maritime fleet in the world. It is therefore obvious also to consider solutions for green maritime fuels, linking energy with green shipping corridors and infrastructures in the North Atlantic. The Nordic region already hold a pole position in the green transition that can be applied to further upskill innovative technologies in the coming, upcoming years. For instance, further development of the hydrogen value change is one of the key enablers for decarbonizing sectors like maritime transportation as well as energy carrier for renewable energy generation. Both the Arctic and our common ocean are vulnerable areas, and the green transition must be truly sustainable, ensuring net positive environmental and biodiversity impact, as well as taking into account coexistence with fishermen, with local communities, and other commercial uses of the ocean space. So this is not an easy task, but I'm actually convinced that we are able to find solutions together and when we work together. In the North Atlantic countries, uh, and where, if, if we are there to meet uh, our ambitious energy and climate goals, policy makers must consider the vulnerabilities of a decarbonizing energy system and ensuring our energy cooperation and interlinked systems. From, and from the Nordic side, from the Nordic region side, we are well on our way. All the Nordic energy ministers met two days ago here in Reykjavik. And in the declaration from the ministerial meeting, the ministers recognize that offshore wind energy has the potential to increase the production of renewable energy considerably. And that the North Atlantic, together with the North Sea, the Baltic Sea, and the Barents Sea, all are areas that are especially favorable for deployments. The Nordic Corporation can contribute to utilize these large potentials, including cooperation on infrastructures, as well as concerns for the environment, biodiversity, public acceptance, and security. When joining and when, when, when you, we join knowledge building, we can support innovative and sustainable solutions. So, also, finally, in addition, in the Nordic Council of Ministers, we are well deep into the process of setting the scene for the Nordic Corporation for the next six years up to 2030. We are constantly working on clear political priorities, addressing cross-sector issues and doing our best to ensure broad anchoring of central Nordic cooperation partners. So therefore, we have the hub. The topic of this conference is very timely and I really hope that we will continue good discussions, of course, here at the session, but continuously. Thank you very much.
much for your presentation. Uh, I can't wait to dive into many of the topics you mentioned, particularly offshore energy, which I know is something that is close to our next speaker's heart. Uh, we're going to hear from uh, Gillian Martin, the Minister for Energy and Environment from Scotland. The floor is yours. Thank you, Hela, and, and thank you, Daria, as well, and, and, and uh, uh, Mr. Grimson for, for, for his opening uh, remarks as well, which really chimed with, with me um, as uh, I was thinking, reflecting back on what he said about how many members of my family, um, traditionally my, gr my grandparents, uh, brothers and sisters, all moved to Canada, United States, and, 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 and never came back. So uh, that's a story that echoes with a lot of Scottish families too. Um, I'm delighted to be back at the Arctic Circle Assembly. I've been here before as a member of the Scottish Parliament, um, but this year, for the first time, I'm participating as a Scottish Government Minister. Uh, as so many other Scottish Government Ministers, we have had uh, representation from the Scottish Government at every single uh, Arctic Circle Assembly, uh, and uh, including our former First Minister, who's been here uh, quite a few times. I'm from the northeast of Scotland, and that is an area that is renowned as being the oil and gas capital of Europe. Um, and before becoming a politician, I spent many years involved with the industry in training and communications. Um, I've spent more time hanging on to my hard hat and in uh, very windy conditions in the North Sea, so much so that I have been a bit of an expert about negotiating the streets of Reykjavik uh, this <laughs> week. Um, it's, it's a privilege to be able to use the experience that I've had in oil and gas um, to help Scotland uh, enter uh, a new era. I'm tremendously excited to be the Energy and Environment M uh, Minister and bring that expertise because it's that um, engineering heritage in oil and gas that gives Scotland a I, I guess a massive advantage in creating a renewables future. Um, we're not starting from scratch. It's different energy, but it is very much a, a lot of the same skills and a lot of the same people that are going to be delivering on that. Uh, we're very, very fortunate. And we're fortunate to have a second go at uh, producing a, a substantial amount of energy um, for, for, the, for ourselves and for export. Um, but Scotland was also the first um, country to declare a global climate emergency, and that was from our former First Minister declared that in 2019. We've got an enviable track record in renewables and an abundance of green energy resources, but the true, true potential of renewable energy revolution can only be realised if we work with our neighbours. We cannot do it alone, and we should not do it alone. As you may have heard uh, my colleagues say at the conference before, that Scotland is the most northerly non-Arctic nation. And I've said so many times, and I'm hoping that this catches on as a slogan, that Scotland is spiritually Nordic. Yeah? I feel it, and I feel it every time I'm, I visit the Nordic, Nordic regions. But we sit geographically in a key strategic position connecting the European Arctic with Central Europe and North America. And uh, I think that's neatly described by uh, the, the, the slide that you're looking at now. The dramatic uh, effects of climate change in the Arctic are also happening on my doorstep. They're happening on my doorstep right now, actually, and my constituency over the last 24 hours has experienced extreme flooding, um, and not for the first time. We have stopped referring to those events as one in uh, 100 years events, because they just aren't anymore. Um, and as uh, geopolitics become increasingly uncertain, we look at our shared northern neighbourhood as a group of very much like-minded countries sharing a common ambition, that of accelerating our transition to net zero, providing green energy security for our region and beyond, and 
exporting our expertise across the world. I feel very strongly that we have a responsibility to do that. This is a global endeavour and we might be moving first and fast, but we have to uh, share that knowledge as much as possible. I'm proud to be on a panel today with my colleagues from our uh, North Atlantic, Atlantic Energy Hub, which I think we have just declared as being official. Uh, th this morning. Um, each of our countries brings something to the table. Uh, no one is in competition with one another because the challenge is too big, it's too complex, we all have something to give, we have to work together as a green energy jigsaw. And I do, as you know, a jigsaw will never be complete without all the pieces. So I want to talk a little bit about what Scotland can offer our piece of the jigsaw. We are already a leading producer and net exporter of low carbon energy and in 2022 we generated enough renewable electricity to power all our Scottish households for around three and a half years. And I'll come back to the, the concept of, of, of surplus because obviously as, you know, wind energy uh, has to be used almost as it's, as it's generated. Um, and that is a problem in some ways but it's also an opportunity in so many others. We have got 18,000 kilometres of coastline and reliable marine and wind resource uh, that uh, prompts our vast renewable energy potential. And, um, the, the, the map on the screen is taken from the Scottish Government's draft energy strategy and just transition plan, which was published earlier this year and will be finalised next year. It highlights areas of activity across the energy system, from offshore wind and hydrogen to marine energy and carbon capture sites. And it really is a whole Scotland endeavour and it will hopefully be, uh, deliver real meaningful benefits to the people from the whole of Scotland, perhaps in the way that oil and gas didn't because it was very regionally focused in the northeast where I'm from. Um, and if you've visited Scotland, um, you'll know that Scotland can be very windy, as I've mentioned before, maybe not quite as bad as yesterday trying to get to the hotel, um, but it's uh, no surprise so it's no surprise that we have harnessed and, and, and made a great deal of effort in harnessing that, uh, that, that, that uh, natural resource that we have. We've set an ambition for a minimum installed capacity of 20 gigawatts of onshore wind by 2030, and the, that could generate enough electricity to power 19.5 million homes per year. And you'll know from the size of Scotland, we do not have 19.5 million homes in Scotland. Uh, a lot less than that. Um, our offshore wind sector is arguably even more exciting, not that I'm playing favourites, um, but it's one that we're already recognised as global leaders. I've lost count of the amount of conversations I've had in the last couple of days where that has been pointed out to, to, to me um, and I, you know, I, I can't get enough of that frankly so keep going with that. Um, following the recent uh, leasing around Scotland's now got a potential pipeline for over 40 gigawatts of offshore wind capacity. This is the equivalent of producing enough electricity to annually power every home in Scotland for 17 years. Uh, with a wealth, as I said, of offshore skills, maritime skills, working in those harsh environments. We've been doing it since the 1960s. Um, and we have got um, those skills, as we have done with oil and gas so much, we have shared those skills with global partners in the past, and we aim to do that again with great pleasure. I want to talk a little bit about hydrogen, because that comes back to the, what I'm saying about the... The, 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 kind of the, the problem of uh, the access to the, the grid of having a surplus of electricity being generated by all these wind projects, there is not enough capacity for that to go into the electricity grid. So that might be a problem at the first, but it's an opportunity because it's an opportunity to do something else with it. Um, and hydrogen is uh, one of our great ambitions in that regard. Our ports 
are going to be crucial for that transformative contribution that Scotland can bring to the energy transition, um, connected to hydrogen in particular. We were the first nation in the UK to set out a policy statement on hydrogen. We're forging ahead in the commercial development of these technologies. We have great interests from countries around the world as to what we're doing in hydrogen and a great deal of them wanting to invest in what we're doing in hydrogen. We have regional hydrogen hubs uh, been established across Scotland already. Some of them have been working for a number of years. And we can host the entire value chain. And our ambition is to export renewable hydrogen. We want to use as much of it as possible domestically. But again, we will have more than enough uh, to, to satisfy that demand and we will have a surplus which we would want to export and we know that we already that we have a, we, we have customers lined up for that al already because European nations are decarbonising their in uh, industrial uh, sectors. Um, our offer is complemented by expertise in marine energy. As I said, we host the European Marine Energy Centre, EMEC, in Orkney, the world's only fully accredited test and research facility for wave and tidal energy. And there are huge opportunities around carbon capture, utilisation and storage with ready access to depleted oil and gas fields. Um, and I, anybody who wants to come and visit any of those projects that I've mentioned and some that I haven't, you know, you only have to to get in touch with the Scottish Government if you're coming over and we can facilitate that. With, we would be delighted to show you what's on, on offer there. The size of the opportunity, the challenge we face, means there is no need for any one country to seek a monopoly. We're all doing different things, we're all doing complementary things, we can work together. We pull that expertise to deliver a decarbonised, affordable, secure energy system in our shared North Atlantic neighbourhood. Scotland stands ready, as it always has. We're looking north, as Mr Grimson says, we always have actually been looking north, I have to say, but with more intensity than ever before. I'm delighted to be part of this panel today and answer any of your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gillian. I can't wait to dive deeper into these issues. And I'm particularly glad that you managed to you know, you're well prepared for the Icelandic wind. <laughs> you know, it's our way to keep guests in the country. We have them land and then we have them stuck here. So it's a part of diplomacy. <laughs> Anyways, uh, we're going to move uh, now to uh, the Minister for Environment, Energy and Climate from Iceland, Guðlaug uh, Thór. The floor is yours. Distinguished Ministers, uh, Secretary General, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for the invitation to this event on the North Atlantic Green Energy Hub. The concept is indeed quite exciting and relevant to Iceland, given its central geographical location and numerous strength in the renewable energy field. The idea of physical integration and connection within the region is something we see as a more as a future scenario. I think the president called it a, a hot pet potato, and we can maybe uh, discuss it a little later on the panel, because uh, it's more imminent for us to focus on the pressing need for current energy demand in our country. And we have, uh, we need a lot of uh, green energy very quickly. If we look to the near future, the collaboration and knowledge sharing of our neighbouring countries in the North Atlantic could add to the security and strength of the region, as well as independent countries. And by fostering cooperation and integration with our neighbours, we can collectively harness the power of renewable energy to meet our growing energy needs. The collective effort could cre create a greener, more sustainable and secure energy future for the entire region. And the added value of uh, Iceland in the vision of a green hub is the potential of geothermal and hydroelectric uh, resources. These resources have been harnessed for decades to power our homes, industries and even our vehicles, significantly reducing our carbon footprint. This initiative 
goes beyond just renewable electricity generation. It includes the production of green hydrogen. Green hydrogen produced using renewable energy can be a game changer for various sectors, such as transportation and heavy industries. It is an opportunity to reduce carbon emission and create new economic opportunities in our region. And Iceland is an important hub for aviation and shipping in the North Atlantic. And to put it in some perspective, people maybe do not realize, maybe because of the wind that uh, many of you couldn't come and the others are worried that you're going to be stuck. But uh, it's not always like this. And we have 8 million passengers who go through Keflavik each year. So we, and uh, that's quite big for uh, a small population. So the future calls for e-fuels and sustainable aviation fuel to provide these sectors is, uh, is a good and interesting challenge. But in conclusion, the North Atlantic Green Hub aligns with Iceland's natural strengths and our commitments to sustainability. And through collaboration and innovation, we can strengthen our region in renewable energy, giving us a more secure and prosperous North Atlantic. And thank you, and let's work together to strengthen the North Atlantic Green Energy Hub, which actually was established this morning with a speech from Ola Ragnar Grimsson. <laughs> Thank you so much, Gula Thor. Looking forward to dive into the hydrogen elements here later on. Uh, as was mentioned here earlier, we had uh, a cancellation from Kalistat Lund. So we're going to watch a video from Greenland. Sille pissusieta a slengore artonera a kion yaslu, nunar suamita mammi, nunet avenarsli, canok ilion nursut, melina figina rapput. Am mammi pissare a rapport. Nunet chinni sida pissusieta a slengore artonera, arkrisina yunar pork, king on a risado, se cortut, madunar serapput. Si unisemido sudi, se cortunarususaput. Kalashli Nunani sida pissusieta a slengon rata, king on a risar pissaputs, inunitinido, soon new to rataput. Sila tinguetini, a slengutit pissaput. Nunarsu at a makerlu, getsikiarton ranut, senisu lugu isit top, being a soriamic, sukanarusumic, getsikiarto pop. Nelunarsu is under its alarti medali. Siusurpamik, a hustimi, two thousand in a two vimi, Nunetini, some mursu, portuner sani, a pinani, siesler pop. Inuia catigit, uliamic, ecumatisenic, a dui fiumi tuts, and when you are an The Arctic is the message, I can say. <laughs> All right. Okay, we'll start the conversation from here. <laughs> Let's see. Okay. Well, I w actually want to start where the where President Gr Grimson left us. You know, he talked about the era when people were leaving this region, leaving our countries going to find other places, not believing in the future. And here we are talking about how we can, you know, advance the energy sectors to create a bright future for our communities at home, but also to export knowledge and to have an impact in the world. Mm -hmm. And I actually want to start with you, Gillian, because you had such a fascinating um, introduction where you were sharing some of the steps that you have taken in offshore wind. And if you could share with us a bit more, you know, how was that vision changing communities or meant to change communities at home? And how do you hope that this sector will be a pillar in your expert abroad? So it's actually, um, at the moment, it is um, it's exciting, but it's also 
there's apprehension from the traditional oil and gas workers. Maybe not so much the companies, because the companies, the you know, companies that have been established, particularly in my home city of Aberdeen, for so many decades, uh, partnered with other smaller companies to take the options for Scotwind. And Scotwind is, uh, the ambition is to produce 28 gigawatts of floating offshore wind. Um, and they have, I mean, we, we originally only had the options for 11 gigawatts, but such was the interest that it was increased to 28 gigawatts. So that is happening. Those companies and those consortia have come together. They've bid for that. But we, um, I think from a public point of view, particularly a public point of view um, in the, my part of Scotland, from the oil and gas workforce, they're very, uh, excited to be involved in that but the jobs aren't going to happen tomorrow you know but we are having to have the conversation about the work is starting now how do we harness the expertise that's in oil and gas how do we facilitate the individuals working in oil and gas who want to transition into renewables? Now, how do we change the conversation around this? Because it's not oil and gas over here and renewables over here, it's energy. It's energy. And we're gonna have a situation for many, many years where um, we are gonna have a workforce. If we get this right, and I am determined we're gonna get this right, that we will be going from project to project, back and forth, back and forth, projects as they're required. And it won't be, I have transitioned to renewables. It will be, I'm in the energy workforce and I work across a lot of projects. Um, because we still have oil and gas, but we have this potential for renewables. At its peak, we predict that the workforce required to service the Scott Wind uh, uh, developments will be more than oil and gas ever was at its peak. But also, another prize there for the lifestyles of the people in that area. It will not require people to be leaving their families for three weeks at a time. It will be more inclusive in that I, I, I already am seeing there is a better gender balance associated with it. We certainly cannot have, a, we need too many people for it to just be a, a male-dominated uh, workforce. But the conditions of that workforce will mean that the crews that are actually servicing this um, won't be staying uh, out in the North Sea for week, weeks on end. So at the moment, we have, we've got massive ambition. We know, it's, we know it's gonna happen. We need to make sure that the supply chain that works for oil and gas sees the opportunities of offshore wind and starts to be, incrementally taking on those contracts so that we've got a mix and over time the oil and gas contracts are going down as it becomes more difficult to, to extract from the North Sea and the offshore wind projects uh, go down but we at the moment have to have uh, encourage confidence in that area. Mm -hmm. And a bit about the export how you foresee the future in exporting that knowledge if I can continue. Well, the export opportunity um, will require a great deal of investment in the infrastructure and the interconnectors between uh, different countries, but it also will require, I think it will require, um, it's, it's actually not, not just going to be export, because we, are, we have big ambitions to export hydrogen, as I mentioned in my speech, but we have the potential and we have the infrastructure and we have the projects to import carbon into carbon capture and storage as well. So we are looking at re repurposing existing infrastructure in order to be able to do that. But there's no doubt that the infrastructure required, particularly for the exporting of hydrogen, will actually require multinational, multinational collaboration mm -hmm. because it is expensive, mm -hmm. but there is a demand for it and we don't want you know, the hydrogen that we are producing being stuck in Scotland and not able to be exported. So I think those conversations are starting in earnest now about how we do that. Um, but you know, Scotland can't do that on its own. It's collaboration with the people as well who want to take that hydrogen from us. Um, looking at our ports as well, um, there will be the opportunity to be uh, shipping um, ammonia um, and, and uh, 
And innovation in hydrogen is happening so fast that we could have uh, that situation where actual um, liquid hydrogen uh, could be, be exported as well. I mean, I'm told by, I'm not an expert. I mean, I'm the energy minister, but I'm not an engineer. But day on day, I meet people who say, yeah, we're on that. We're, we're, we're working on that. We're innovating on that. That's not going to be a problem. We're getting on with it. And I'm thinking, well, thank goodness. Um, because the, the, but we had all these challenges in the 1970s with uh, oil and gas. And we, we built that industry mm. up. Right. We'll build this industry up. Right. But it's going to be uh, with partnerships. Mm -hmm. And we're going to need partnerships just in terms of knowledge sharing. You, I mean, if we look at offshore wind uh, potential in Iceland and so forth, it's going to require collaboration uh, from, from other experienced countries. So maybe I turn to you, uh, Gullu Thor. You know, we saw a part of the video here from Greenland. Greenland uh, decided not to be a part of the Paris Agreement, then shifted again. Uh, wanting to strive for a green hydrogen future, looking at hydrogen as an export project. Iceland and Greenland have been these close collaborators in energy so far. I mean, what are the options and, and opportunities that you see? And maybe if we continue a bit along the lines of wind. Mm -hmm. Well, as has been mentioned, uh, the opportunities are uh, probably endless and uh, it is uh, being in this job I understand where you're coming from because uh, we have these big challenges we are which are definitely big challenges so you uh, the day can be a little uh, you know uh, maybe doesn't start that well but in the afternoon when you meet someone with the new technology which you didn't know yesterday and it's uh, the only thing you're afraid of is that you uh, we will miss something because when you have all this uh, investment and you, you have all this human capital in innovation in the green field, then uh, so many things are happening so so quickly. I think it, uh, and uh, in my former role as a forum minister, I emphasized a lot on uh, cooperation uh, to our closest neighbors, which is Greenland and, and the Faroes. And uh, we do have a a good, could say, manuscript when it comes to uh, both the report on, on Greenland and uh, same with the, the Faroe Islands, because it makes perfect sense for us. We are, of course, a very small population, uh, close to each other, so we shouldn't be competing. We should be working working together and having uh, Scotland and, and uh, the Nordics also is something that is just is an added value, because. Uh, even though if we combine us all together, then we, in some fields we are relatively big. They are, we are extremely small on the big scale. And it makes uh, perfect sense for uh, like-minded nations uh, who share the uh, uh, same values to work together. Uh, the opportunities when it comes to offshore wind, they are, they are huge. As, as you all know, there are wind in Iceland. I don't need to explain it to you. And uh, as I understand it, and we, can, we will not do it alone. We haven't harnessed the wind, we haven't advanced the solar. You saw in the video here, uh, which I'm trying to explain to my friends in, and, and people in Iceland, that uh, the Greenland, they are far ahead of us when it comes to uh, harnessing the, the, uh, the solar panels. Uh, the same with the wind. Uh, Scotland and uh, all the Nordic counties are just miles away from us when it comes to harnessing the wind. Uh, there's ob we obviously need to do so, both inland and uh, also offshore. The challenge we face when it comes to uh, when it comes to harnessing offshore is that we, because we have uh, made reports about it, and I didn't realize that uh, the seabed has been explored so much more in Scotland, in uh, around Denmark, in, in Norway, because you have been looking for oil and gas. We haven't done that. So uh, we are lacking behind when it comes to, uh, to researching the, the seabed, but that's something we are going to do. And it's definitely one of the things that uh, we look uh, as uh, something we need uh, for, uh, for the future, but it's not, uh, it's not gonna help us in a very short period of time. We see it more as after 20, 2030, the, the offshore wind, but as we understand it, 
and there's a lot of interest that uh, the wind is so big in Iceland, especially uh, in, on the sea, that uh, it can be a very uh, good option, mm -hmm. making green uh, energy. Thank you, Gule Thor. Um, if I turn to you, Karen, you know, you have the Nordic perspective, being the Secretary General of the Nordic Council of Ministers. Uh, how can bodies like the Nordic Council of Ministers help uh, enable this vision? You know, you have, you're a platform of collaboration, there is some funding, but w what are the gaps if we want to uh, strengthen this dimension? I, I appreciate that you say there is some funding because, of course, the Nordic Council of Ministers cannot solve it alone and solely, but we are blessed in the Nordic countries that our prime ministers have decided to have this type of international cooperation organization as the Nordic Council of Ministers, and we also have the Nordic Council where we have all the parliamentarians. So in that perspective, we I consider that we, in many, in many ways, have kind of the seed money to make sure that people meet, people share experiences. We deliver reports, we deliver suggestions to the Nordic governments, and also we deliver the kind of cooperation when looking to, to Scotland that we have for many years have these programs. Maybe some years ago, the focus was mainly on cultural exchange, cultural cooperation, and that has extended. And of course, that comes with a price. Just to let you know, I know uh, now we're talking about uh, energy hubs. And in general, I think it's important also to, to make sure that we talk about the, the social resilience and that we make sure that our populations uh, are on the track here and, and see the perspective and see the possibilities. And, and when I say that, it's because we have had huge discussions within the Nordic Council of Ministers, also with the Nordic Council, when it comes to where do we prioritize the budget that we have. Traditionally, we would say lots of uh, cultural exchange, lots of education exchange. And when we also want lots of exchange on energy supply and lots of projects there, we need to leverage that. that. So. It's not to say that we do not have funding for this, because we definitely do. And there has been a huge willingness, of course, with the whole ministerial body, which counts for, for several ministers, um, but also with the council, the, 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 the parliamentarians. And it's, it's funny, I used to serve as Minister of, in the, of, of the Environment in Denmark. And, uh, and when I was together with my uh, Nordic colleagues, or even internationally, we could always agree to to do a lot. We wanted this and this and that and all of these projects and all of this research and innovation and so on. But then the finance ministers came and then we had the trouble. So that's, that's also what happens here. But I mentioned briefly in my introduction that all the, the Nordic ministers of energy, Ulladur as, as the host, were, were joined here two days ago. I tell you, there was such good discussions going on, such a willingness and that declaration really shows that we insist on having not only Nordic cooperation, but also knowing our role uh, in a broader context. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, well, I can recommend that you look at, at the website uh, norden.org to see the declaration, to see the wording, because it's ambitious and it's very clear that, that this is, I mean, this is prioritized. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Karen, and I want to compliment the work that you're doing in terms of also, you know, focusing with the Nordic Energy Research on research collaboration, because that's also supporting industry, right? Um, I want to engage all of you uh, into the dialogue, so I'm hoping that you will be bringing some good questions here. I'm going to throw one more uh, uh, at the panel before we open up the floor to questions. So. Uh, give some thought to what you want to ask. Uh, and I want to, you know, we, we spoke about uh, the region uh, or our region having the potential to really uh, become this hub. And the president used the term Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when having the conversation with you, Gillian, you were talking about the visit uh, to the resource park that we have here, the geothermal resource park. 
And, you know, I'd say that they are tiny little Silicon Valleys, and you have spoken so often about, Gullu um, thought about, you know, our exporting knowledge and, you know, making Iceland a hub through a knowledge-based industry, really. Uh, so all of this sounds fantastic, right? But there are some challenges. There are challenges when it comes to the implementation phase. Uh, we spoke about some of them um, uh, during our uh, meetings yesterday that relate to public acceptance, you know, how to balance development versus nature conservation and so forth. So if I could ask you just to crystallize, like what are the key challenges that you are facing in your own uh, roles uh, and, and communities? Um, and maybe start with you, Gillian. The thing that worries me most about um, my population in Scotland is fuel poverty. And when I visited your little mini Silicon Valley in a geothermal plant right next to the, the Blue Lagoon when we arrived um, this week, I was filled with awe, admiration, but envy at the geothermal um, uh, sector in, in Iceland because your homes are warm. Your homes are warm and you don't have fuel poverty and everybody, you know, the, the health impact of that probably can't be underestimated. In Scotland, we are the, of, the, of the UK uh, nations, we have the highest fuel poverty, particularly in rural Scotland. Now, the conundrum is that it is going to be rural Scotland that hosts the vast amount of renewable energy infrastructure. The transmission infrastructure, the uh, onshore wind turbines, and yet to those communities, they are asking, and rightly they are asking, how is this going to translate into me being able to afford to heat and fuel my home? Because we have an energy crisis, we have uh, people who cannot afford to pay their bills. We have people who have become ill because they cannot heat their homes. And what are we getting out of this? It is an absolutely pertinent and reasonable question. And the answer is not simple because the way that the, uh, the fuel markets, the gas and the electricity markets in the UK work does not mean that you can have cheaper uh, energy um, because you are right next to a wind turbine uh, or right next to energy infrastructure. It just doesn't work that way. So how do we, as a devolved nation, uh, without all the energies around the, 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 the powers around the energy markets help? Well, we, the, the, the challenge that I am putting to the developers of this infrastructure and this renewable electricity particularly in onshore wind, is how are you going to make life in the communities that host you easier? How are you going to give them the benefits of being hosts to you? The disruption, the visual impact um, of, of what you're doing in a way that is not just about building a community centre, painting a school, We've done that, we've done that. Then you know that I, I use the phrase, you know, there's only so many times you can paint a scout hut, you know? Particularly when you're in communities that can't afford to put the radiators up uh, during the harshest of winters. So I've put that challenge to them, I put it to them every time I meet. And I'm, you know, I'm interested in some of the answers that come back. I'm interested in some of the projects that come back, but they're really going to have to think creatively because that is the biggest challenge in Scotland right now is we're producing. I told you all the figures of the electricity and the generation that we are producing. Do the people of Scotland see the benefit of that? Yeah, you maybe do if you're working in those industries. Do the ordinary householders in the highlands of Scotland and the northeast of Scotland see the benefit of that in their fuel bills? No, they do not. That's our challenge. Thank you so much. Uh, that's very insightful. Gula Thor, if I could pass the torch to you. Yes, thank you. I, I've tried to be brief. Um, there are a few challenges. First of all, uh, we do 
like everywhere else, everywhere else I, I believe, have some kind of polarization, which links to another challenge with that uh, lack of facts. Uh, there's all kinds of misunderstanding. One is that we can somehow solve uh, the, uh, achieve our climate goals without green energy. I think it's mostly in Iceland. I don't think there are many other countries who uh, share that uh, problem, but also you have all kinds of uh, yeah, misinformation. That's nothing new. It's not, not like uh, that's the first time in, in history that we have misinformation. I've been in politics for quite a long time, and I don't remember anyone ever saying, I just like the political debate. It's just always based on facts, and everyone is so polite. And I've never heard anyone say it, so uh, maybe one day it will uh, come, but uh, I, I haven't heard it. Then, of course, and I don't think, uh, I think it's a something that we always need to bear in mind. I don't see it as a problem. I, I see it something like a project that we always need to uh, balance with uh, nature conservation. And uh, of course everywhere, but especially in Iceland, because we are responsible for the, uh, well, we have the largest desert in, in, in Europe, which is uh, uh, something that we need to uh, uh, see to it that it will be there for future generations to come, but of course there are other challenges also, and this uh, common challenge, not in my backyard, is something that we are of course dealing with too. And uh, to end this, I think it's really important also that it's not like a, we cannot look at it as a silo, as a environment ministers or energy ministers. This needs to go to uh, the whole public, especially uh, research and development. We need uh, the universities and the school systems. Uh, if we are going to achieve, because we need so much of uh, both uh, public acceptance, they need to understand what we are doing and uh, why, but also we need so much expertise and human resources, and uh, it's really important that our future generations are uh, studying uh, something that will help us achieve our goals. Thank you, Kula Thor. I, I actually thought it was really interesting in terms of bringing expertise closer together, mm. that both of you are holding you know, being the ministers of energy and environment, which is, you know, a sign of that. Mm. Uh, if I go over to you, Karen, and kind of, you know, uh, we, we had the dialogue yesterday uh, about public acceptance as well, um, and uh, the challenges that we see in, in different parts uh, of the Nordics. How uh, can a body like the Nordic Council of Ministers contribute here? The short answer is keep on doing what we are doing, bringing people together, making sure that dialogue takes place, that we keep on investing in research and development, and that we keep on nurturing that very, very precious model we have in the Nordic countries, not only in the Nordic, luckily, <laughs> but strong democracies, strong, uh, strong institutions that actually even though we, yes, have heavy discussions going on and polarization and fake news of, and all of that, but still, at the end of the day, we are well-developed, well-educated uh, populations. And making sure that we keep on having this very important functioning triangle where you have the businesses, you have the researchers, and you have the politicians, and they are not strangers to each other. They actually talk. Civil servants, of course, covering all of that, and the journalists and the media. But this kind of picture of our democracy and this basic Nordic gold, our trust, that's something that we really cannot just take for granted. And that's why we need to be very aware that we nurture it, that we make sure that people can meet, people can talk, people can exchange best practices, maybe even worst practices, because that's also lessons learned. And then maybe also making sure that we cannot be number one. I mean, within the Nordic Council of Ministers, we always have this very, I, I would say, fun competition between the Nordic countries, who is number one in this and this. Iceland is always number one in many things. But that's healthy. It's the huge family competing, and we should not be number one in everything, all of us, but knowing that combined, okay, you have the ge geothermal,
Greenland has uh, the hydropower. So when you map us together, there are no blind spots. Thank you, Karen, and thank you for reminding us of having an active dialogue, because that's what we're going to focus on now. Um, so I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. I can see three hands, and I'm actually going to ask all of you to put forward your questions, and then uh, we're going to take all of them uh, at the same time. So please remember to introduce yourself and uh, be brief with your question. Thank you, and because of time. Thank you. Arman Sarvarian, University of Surrey. I'm presenting tomorrow on a panel called Investing in Climate Change Mitigation in the Arctic. My question is to the panel at large, and it concerns the declaration of two days ago and the role of offshore wind, which was specifically mentioned in the declaration. In, I wonder whether there's any sense of prioritization amongst the sources of wind production, or rather uh, energy production taking into account considerations such as environmental impact assessments. When it comes to solar, a problem is the recyclability of the photovoltaic panels, uh, which is very low, so they're effectively single use, and that creates uh, uh, upstream problems. When it, nuclear wasn't discussed, but those are well known, uh, the, the nuclear problems with uh, wider environment. Hydroelectricity, uh, the increasingly understood the sedimentation and other effects on biodiversity from it. Uh, my understanding is in Iceland, for example, no new hydroelectric works uh, will be constructed. So I'm curious, uh, mentioned, the, the minister mentioned the problem of nimbyism and so on. In the UK, it's onshore wind is the main problem, uh, as in Germany. So I'm curious to what extent the Nordic countries are putting that emphasis on offshore wind uh, and thinking in terms of the, uh, the collective approach and prioritization. Thank mm. you. Thank you. So we have a question here in the front, and then we had one, oh, one here as well. Yeah, this lady here in the pink jacket. Yes, yeah, sorry, Klaus. That's okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Clarissa Duvin, your German ambassador to Iceland. And obviously, we are envious. And, uh, but it was interesting to listen to you about your cooperation. And the question I want to ask every one of you is if a company from Central Europe comes to you or a government mm. and says, let's cooperate, mm. let's work together on this. What is your answer where we can come in concretely with help, with cooperation, with things to work on, in order, of course, to in the end have a partnership with you? Thank you. Thank you. And then we have Rocky here in the front. Thank you. Um, I'm Rocky White. So I'm Director of Maritime Studies at Tufts University's Fletcher School. Um, I'm writing a paper about how offshore, floating offshore wind could electrolyze seawater to create green hydrogen, green ammonia for the sh shipping industry's green energy transition. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at the Aleutian Islands because they're right on the Great Circle route. So it'd be a nice refueling area. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty sure the North Atlantic countries would be a, a good refueling area. So I wanted to think about, uh, hear your thoughts on that idea. Um, and just, I'm greatly envious, I'm from the US, where we're totally dysfunctional in all of these things. Um, so you all inspire us that uh, it can work hmm. in democracy. So thank you all. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you for a good question. So I'm gonna ask, uh, Gillian, maybe I'll pass the torch first to you regarding the offshore wind. Yeah, yeah, and um, I, I, I think for my colleague from the University of Surrey, I, I can't answer some of the parts of that question. I wasn't in the, the, the declaration meetings, but I can. You, you hit upon environmental impact. <clears throat> and uh, with regard to, I, I'll, I'll deal with offshore wind in, in particular, because this is one of the most pressing issues that we have with regard to the development of, of offshore wind. And it is, uh, it is a challenge to be the Minister for Energy that is tasked with delivering on our offshore wind ambition, which is significant and will require an awful lot of pieces of kit to go into the water. Marrying that with my uh, responsibilities as the, the Environment Minister, um, who has to have a very keen eye on what we're doing in marine spatial planning. And although um, it's been mentioned that, that, that Scotland has an advantage in having had so many surveys of the seabed with regard to oil and gas, 
Um, most oil and gas platforms are beyond the, the 12 nautical miles that, the, the, that we have licensed um, for uh, the, the production of floating offshore wind and what is the impact going to be. So a couple of things. We absolutely cannot do this by keeping out other sectors out of the room on this because they will be impacted and we need to share as much knowledge as possible and I'm talking particularly about our, our fishing industry. I've got responsibilities for inshore fisheries as well and they have significant concerns about the impact of the infrastructure from offshore wind, particularly around the, the cabling, not just the actual turbines themselves, but the cabling and what impact that's going to have on the the stocks that they fish, what impact that's going to have, the, the built, the, you know, the, the, the construction, the, you know, are they going to be displaced? And we're working very hard to improve the data around this, because only with robust, comprehensive and indisputable data can you arrive with this, and, and decisions as to what goes where and who might be impacted and what might be impacted by what you're doing. Um, so I'm using both my portfolios in that regard. In inshore fisheries, we are working with the, 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 the sector to have remote electronic monitoring on their fishing vessels for a number of reasons, but one of those reasons is to actually find out what is, what is where in terms of fish stocks. And um, we are also doing um, uh, you know, work with the uh, developers of the, the developments on the, the surveying of what, where they're going to be laying their infrastructure as well. And having a more comprehensive, factual understanding of what should go where, and that's not easy. But one of the things that I would say in regard to that is we currently don't have enough people with expertise in that area. We've got lots, but we don't have enough given the ambition that we've got. And if I've got one piece of advice for anybody that is interested in, or any of the young people here that are thinking about going to university or thinking about what they can be doing in regard to offshore wind, um, look at being part of the solution and finding that data and the impact, environmental impact assessment because you will never be out of work. <laughs> and uh, let me know if you want to work for the Scottish Government. Okay, thank you so much. We don't have a lot of time left, so I want to ask you to be brief and uh, perhaps uh, if you could focus on the, Europe, uh, the question from the German ambassador as well in terms of not only North Atlantic collaboration but collaboration with, uh, with others, the, the processes. And so I'm going to uh, allocate 60 seconds to you know, all of you. So if I start with you, Gullur. Okay, um, that's tough, because they are good questions. First of all, uh, with uh, the floating offshore, which is obviously a very uh, exciting idea, uh, and uh, you get, you, you, I am no expert in construct, sounds good. Uh, <laughs> we, uh, when it comes to, uh, but it reminds me just of a company which is uh, newly established, very close, who's called Sidewinds, which is, uh, Basically, you are making electricity on the sea, new way of, of sailing with sails. Uh, when it comes to uh, uh, cooperation with, uh, with countries in Central Europe, yes, definitely. And uh, of course, most of them want some kind of uh, electricity from us. That's what we are working on. But uh, the opportunities are endless. Of course, we do have uh, companies here who want to uh, do wind. Uh, when it comes to geothermal, there are endless opportunities, deep, deep drilling and a lot of other things, making food. We are just open for, for cooperation. And uh, the last one, which uh, was mentioned with the offshore wind, uh, what the role is, the ones who come and with the ideas of offshore wind, they all want an inter uh, uh, cable to uh, other countries because the electricity in Iceland is relatively cheap. Uh, of course, it helps in that way that the UK has left the European Union because we could never be connected. I think, I think the, po the people never accepted that all the, uh, all the uh, energy prices would uh, rise uh, when you connect to uh, uh, other countries in the EEA uh, area. 
But uh, this is uh, really a discussion which I, I thought we were going to take, but uh, I, I guess my 60 seconds are over. But it's an interesting uh, thing we should, uh, should discuss, because either way, when we're going to, because there will be an offshore wind one day, and either it will sell uh, to some uh, uh, business on, on prices in Iceland, which of course would be very acceptable, or we would have some kind of uh, uh, cable, then it would be a cable to, to Scotland or, or, or England. I don't think we will uh, see it in Europe in the uh, near or distant future. And I don't have 60 seconds because we're way ahead of time, so, or, or, or over time. So just a short cover-up answer would be, don't forget public-private partnerships. That's, I think it hasn't been said, it's extremely important. All right, look at that. Over to you, Gillian. Um, so green hydrogen from seawater has been something that's been mentioned to me uh, before, um, but I, 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 don't, I don't have anything to say other than that. if you can do that, can you let me know? <laughs> um, and uh, again, this is where it comes back to what you were saying earlier, that this morning I didn't know something was a thing. By this afternoon, I'm, some of them are coming to me with projects that they have. Uh, this is why it's so exciting to work in this space. The other thing is the German ambassador, um, I would say that their infrastructure for how we can get things to markets, to different markets, is something we really need to collaborate on because of the, the, the sums of money involved in this. No one country can do it. We all have to work together. How are we going to get green hydrogen to Germany? We've got lots of green hydrogen potential. Germany, I imagine, would like to have a lot of that. Mm -hmm. So we need to work together on how we can actually get the infrastructure ready or repurpose existing infrastructure, regardless of what it is. It's going to be expensive. So leveraging public-private partnerships, as has just been said by, 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 by Karen, is really, really important, but also governments working together to do that and recognising that this is, a, you know, this is a global challenge that we've got here. And it comes back to this jigsaw piece, you know? We're not going to do this alone. Some people have got some parts of the jigsaw, some people have got other parts of the jigsaw. So we need to be, have a can-do attitude and working together. And that would be my big ask of, of partners. How can we get the interconnectors? How can we get the pipeline infrastructure or repurpose the pipeline infrastructure to get these new fuels and these green fuels to market and to the people that need them so that they can decarbonize? Mm -hmm. Excellent. I could see by putting this pressure on you, you cover so much ground in such a short time. We could have <laughs> covered much more here. Anyways, I want to thank you all for joining. Uh, we have covered this very exciting topic uh, on how to create a North Atlantic energy hub. Uh, thank you to the panelists and, and organizers, uh, to the uh, Nordic Research and uh, Nordic Council of Ministers and our friends in Scotland. And I wish you a fantastic conference. Thank you. <laughs>